the words of my mouth and the fruit of my lips be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my Savior. I will praise you, Lord, all the days of my life. I will give thanks to you because you have been good to me.
found victory at Calvary. Thanks, John. So that's what I'm going to play. And you know what's going to happen? We're all going to get to heaven for those that place their trust in him. So I'm going to sing two songs with this little harmonica. I don't have any accompaniment, but you're going to be my accompaniment. In other words, if you want to tap your your, your feet or do anything you want or hum along, that would be wonderful. Okay. Now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a, he was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he, had took, that, he had, that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Uh, why have you torn your robes? Uh, have, have the man uh, come to me? Uh, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Um, but Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. 
and not Abana or uh, Farpar, the, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you uh, to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then uh, when, she, when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? Uh, so he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him to. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. Uh, he stood before him and said, Now I know there is, a God, there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. Uh, but many, the Lord, but may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon uh, to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I bow there also, then I bow down in the temple of Rimmon. May the Lord forgive your servant uh, for this. Go in peace, peace, Elisha said. We have Jen going off to Bible school, and we have the celebration of 60 years and 55 years. Boy, that's a real record. Eh? It's very rare today to have that. And uh, it's definitely a testimony for us with Gordy and uh, with, uh, with Bill that uh, that's a time to be celebrated, and indeed. I'm trying this new gizmo I've got, and I'm just trying to get it going here, and I think we're up and running. Like all good things, before we, uh, before we be begin, let's open in a word of prayer. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the fruit of my lips be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my Savior. I will praise you, Lord, all the days of my life. I will give thanks to you because you have been good to me. Well, this morning we want to look, and you've had the scripture reader reading already this morning, but we want to look at Naaman the leper, a very, very interesting story, the first part of this. Uh, Naaman, of course, was uh, inflicted with leprosy, and he had a chance to be cured, and it's interesting how this uh, story develops, so please uh, follow along with me. Uh, you will notice up here at the front just a little uh, bit of a background on the, the situation, what it was. And if you notice the date there in the ninth century BC, just a little bit of the geography. You'll see here, Naaman was a commander in the Aryan army. And that is, you'll see by uh, denoted by Damascus, that that is modern day Syria. And there's a lot of things that can be said about Syria. They're big in the news today, Damascus. And of course, there's prophecy pertaining to uh, Damascus, and you can look that up. If you look a little bit to the left, the kingdom of Israel, that is a northern Israel, and it is denoted by the capital Samaria. Below it is the southern kingdom, Judah, and it is also denoted by being Jerusalem. Off to the left there on the red is the land of the Philistines. If you go below to the, I guess that would be a yellow, the kingdom of Edom, Edom being a derivative of the word red, uh, Edomites are descendants of uh, of Esau, the brother of Jacob. Uh, Esau meaning uh, ruddy complexion and a hairy person, thus the word red. Edomite means red. If you look a little bit up to the blue and to the mustard colored, you will see the kingdoms of Moab and Ammon. And their significance in history is because they failed to meet the Israelites coming out of Egypt, because they failed to offer them and uh, the Lord used a donkey, as you remember, uh, to speak to them. And it's not the only time that God has used donkeys to do his will. Uh, the, the curse that they had put upon them was that they were forbidden to enter the assembly of the Lord right down to the 10th generation because they failed to do that. And that pretty well is forever 
So that's the significance how they go down in history. So there's a little bit of the background of what we'll be talking about. Now, as you know, there it was bordered on, as you see, Damascus, uh, Aram, is bordered on the northern kingdom, and that's where the prophet Elisha was, or Elisha, depending how you pre how like to you like to pronounce that. So what had happened? Uh, this was a time of relative peace, and uh, there was little skirmishes. And that would explain, as we will see a little bit later, why there was a, a slave girl, a, an Israeli slave girl, in the, the house of Naaman. And uh, there was open communications because later they had interaction. But uh, what happened here? We can move on to the next slide there, please. Uh, now, as you look uh, at this time, Aram, uh, in Aram, it was uh, Ben Hadid was a king, and the Israel's king was son of Ahab, Joram. And we'll talk a little bit about, about Ahab, Ahab and the queen Jezebel. We'll talk about that a little later. But anyway, Naaman had leprosy. Now, at this time, uh, he probably contracted this leprosy later in life. Because as you know, if you were a leper, you were forced to go to a leper colony. And if you were in the streets, you would have to have a bell and shout, on clean, on clean. But at this stage, it must have been uh, just a small spot that had started because he still had rank and he still had standing. And uh, that wasn't a big deal at this time. But as we know, leprosy progresses and eventually you die from it. It's incurable. It's an incurable disease. Now... Naaman was a commander in the Aryan army, and he was a hero. He was something like Colin Powell in today, or uh, Schwarzkamp. Uh, he was, he was a, a hero in the, the land, and he was uh, recognized as such, and he had great high standing. He had, and he was wealthy, and he had uh, importance attached to his name, and he let people know about that. But also, he was uh, also a compassionate person, not only just arrogant, because that little girl who was his slave girl, as we will read just a moment, thought that she would talk to him and uh, make known about the prophet Elisha in Israel. So let's just look at the uh, portion of scripture. You will bear with me. I'll just read a little bit of that. Uh, starting at verse 1, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 to 19. And if you don't have a Bible, I'm sure uh, you'll be able to get one back there. So if you would like a Bible, just raise your hand, and I'm sure the ushers will get one to you there. So as we're doing that, let's carry along. Naaman was the commander of the, the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. Because through him the Lord had given victory to alarm to a ramp. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders for Aram had gone out and taken captive the young girl from the Israel, and, ser and she served Naaman's wife. There's a little slave girl. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So this little girl obviously liked Naaman, and she didn't feel at all like a slave girl. She probably felt like part of the family. Naaman went to his master. That would be the king of Aram. Don't forget, uh, Naaman is in the inner circle. He deals in high society. He is the cream of the crop. So, of course, his master, the king of Aram, is not going to deny him. So he said to him, I will send a letter by all means go, I will send a letter to the king of Israel, who is Joram. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten sets of clothing. Those ten shekels and those uh, silver, those ten talents of silver, that amounts to about 750 pounds of silver. That's a lot of silver, Right? And the gold is 150 pounds of gold. Now, I think, if my memory serves me right, gold currently runs at $1,200 an ounce, somewhere about there, give or take. So we're talking a lot of cash here. And also 10 sets of clothing he was taking with him. Now, I'm sure he wasn't getting those clothes 
at Walmart. And it probably wasn't two for one or buy one and get one 50% off. I think knowing Naaman and his position and with this wealth he was bringing, we're talking Armani here or Calvin Klein. We're not talking small stuff here. And the point is I want to make here is that uh, Naaman, being a high society person, he was, going to, he was going to buy a blessing from the Lord. He was going to purchase his deliverance, his healing. And of course, we know that you can't do that. You can't buy God's blessing. You can't buy a gift from God like that. So if you look at, there, uh, at that next slide there, we have got it. You cannot buy God's blessing. Worldly wealth does not impress the Lord. The Lord looks at the heart. And if you would just look at a, a portion of scripture there also, if we look at uh, the portion of scripture in the book of Acts, you may remember Peter and John were laying hands and they were given the Holy Spirit. Simon the sorcerer, you may recall, he seen this happening. And he approached, now just read the scripture, verse 17, Acts chapter 8, verse, starting at verse 17. Then Peter and John placed hands on them, that's the people where they were visiting, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw the Spirit was given on the land of hands, on the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And said, give me this also this ability so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon also had a bad attitude. Because Peter answered him, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. You can't buy God's blessing. The gift of salvation is free. All gifts, all good things that come from God is free. You cannot hope to attain that. It's a wrong heart to have to try to buy things. And this is where, Laim, or where Naaman was at this stage. His heart was not right with God. And he thought that he could buy God's blessing with worldly wealth. And the wealth that he brought, he probably had an entourage. He probably had chariots and donkeys. Certainly a lot to carry those 10 clothing, those 10 changes of clothing. And certainly 700, 800, 900 pounds of gold and silver would take a lot of donkeys or carriages to carry that. The king at this time was Joram. And he was the son of Ahab. Now, you may remember Ahab and Jezebel, they went down in history in infamy as being the wickedest king and, and king in Israel. There was only one other place recorded in scriptures where the name Ahab is. Jezebel has never again been used as a name. I've never heard anyone call their children Jezebel. I've never heard anyone say that my daughter's going to be called Jezebel because those names go down in infamy. And uh, the only, the only uh, other instance I have of Jezebel, when I was at high school, my teacher had a cane. And I met that cane often. And her name was Jezebel. <laughs> Boy, and he knew how to use that in a wicked way, I'll tell you. But you don't need to know any more about that, right? Anyway, Joram, he was the son of his father. Ahab was wicked, and he was influenced by Jezebel, who was a wicked, wicked queen. As it happens in those days, if you had in those days, if you had a good king whose heart was turned to do, towards the Lord, then the nation was good and prospered, both in Israel and in, in Jerusalem and Judah. But if you had a wicked king, the people, they fell away too, and they soon fell into idolatry. And it's no surprise that Joram did not recognize God's hand in this, what God was going to do with, Nahum, with Naaman. It is no surprise at all that uh, he didn't see, he was not aware. And it wasn't until Elisha told him, listen, send him to me. And I sometimes wonder, in our course of life, do we sometimes miss the Lord's blessing? 
Do we miss an opportunity where the Lord might be using us to talk to someone? He might be using us to bring about his will. But if we're not spiritually discerned or we're not w watching for that, as Joram, he was too busy. He was too busy thinking about politics and also about the economics, and he thought that this king wanted to start a war with him. He was far away from God's will or God's leading as he could be. And that's a lesson for us. Are we watching for God's leading? Are we prepared? Someone might ask you to do something. You might get a telephone call, but you might be too busy and you might miss the, ble the blessing of the Lord. Okay, there you go. <laughs> it could be something. <laughs> I want you to do something. But you could miss the Lord's blessing because you're not tuned into it. So obviously, Alicia was in better tune. And he spoke and he said, send him to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Okay, now as we move on now to verses 9 to 12, we just want to see uh, what was happening here with, uh, with Naaman. Verses 9 to 12, we're right back on course here. So it said that Naaman went with the horses and chariots and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him to say, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Note, you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over this spot and cure me of the leprosy. And of course, he meets, makes note to his own country, Aram. And he said, are the... Rivers Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, not better than all the waters of Israel. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went away in a rage. Significant piece of scripture there. If you will notice that he was guaranteed, he was guaranteed a cure. He didn't have to pray and wait. Naaman said, go and wash and you will be cured. Not maybe, he said, you will be cured if you go to the Jordan and wash seven times, your leprosy will be cleansed. But don't forget who we're talking about here. We're talking about Naaman. When he arrived at Elisha's house, I can just see him coming with that entourage. You can see him coming. He was a commander in the army. We'll ha he'll have a contingent of soldiers because of hostilities. He wants to be protected. He'll have probably the white horses at the front with the plumes coming. He'll probably have an ounce coming along, and he'll stop. And he'll probably have uh, that caravan with the gold, the silver, and all those clothes. And he's looking for the brass band. He's looking for the welcome committee. He's looking for the national anthem. And he's looking around, at least a barbecue. That, you know, they should have something going on. But what happens? Alicia doesn't even bother to come out and talk to him and say, welcome, O Lord, most, most worthy master. He sends a servant, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was a, a servant girl. And said, oh, tell him to go and wash himself seven times in the river, the Jordan. And Naaman says, say what? What's going on? You're supposed to come and cleanse me. You call in the name of your Lord, your God, and touch the spot. And I will be cleansed because I'm next. Listen, I'm, I'm here with the king of Aram. I brought this. You come and you cure me. And you call in the name of the Lord, your God, and have the bugles and the trumpets going and everything, and I will be cleansed. And that's the way we do things where I come from because I name him. So what did he do? He went off in a rage. Now, if you notice there, he went off in a rage. His pride, his pride got in the way. At this point, now don't forget, if you have leprosy, it gets worse, it doesn't get better. Right? Sooner or later, oh, sorry, we're not on here, are we? I have to take this back to the Dollarama and get a new one. <laughs> Anything happening there now? Do you read me? Do you read me? Copy? Okay. Anyway, so what happened was his pride got in the way. 
His okay, we'll use this one then. Thanks. I'm just getting signals from Max there. Max Italian, notice how he uses his hands. Very good, Max. Thank you. Anyway, his pride, his ego was more important at this time than him being cured. How can you be so blinded that when you're guaranteed a cure, when you're guaranteed that you will be cured, you don't have to pray, you don't have to go up front, and because of his pride, because his ego was hurt, he didn't want to know, he went away in a rage. It was more important for him to retain his self-esteem because he wasn't treated with that importance. He wasn't treated what he demanded that he should be treated. And he went away. He missed the opportunity of being cleansed. And I just wonder sometimes with us, does our pride interfere with relationships that we have? You know, they say in the Christian church that the divorce rate and the separation rate is just as high as out in the world. And I wonder, is that because of pride? And sometimes I think of uh, with parents and children or with siblings or in the workplace or even in the church where there's factions. I wonder, is that all to do with pride where we don't humble ourselves and realize we, are not, we have no right to be proud? We are on the receiving end of a blessing and mercy. Why, how can we afford the pride? It's a, lux a luxury that we should have no part in. But uh, Naaman was blinded by his emotions and by his pride. So what happens next then? As I noted before, that his servants thought a lot about him. His servants thought a lot about him. He must have been a good master that way. So what happens? His, uh, one of his servants, they approach him, and they said to him, listen, why don't you do that? Now let's look at that portion of scripture, and let me just recap that. Uh, 2 Kings 5, verses 13 to 19. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a boy. He was cured. He was cured of that. Now get this. Then Naaman and his attendants went back to the man of God. But I'm just thinking, before we get, get to that part, when his attendant said to him, Naaman, what's going on? Oh, sorry. <laughs> get carried away. <laughs> when, his ascendants, uh, when his attendants approached him, I can just see one of them saying, Hey, what's the matter, you? You know, capiche. Why you not go? It's, it's a simple thing. Just go down to the water and be washed and you'll be cleansed. So Naaman probably listened to him. And, uh, well, of course he did, and away he went. So he was cleansed. Now, something happened between that time that Naaman came to see Elisha and when he went down in the waters. When he went down those seven times and came up, he was cleansed. It's almost like the Christian baptism. When you go down into those waters, you die to yourself. And when you come up, you're cleansed. You're a new person, a new creature in Christ. Your sins, not that the water washes away the sins, but it's a symbol that you have been cleansed. And the same with the waters. The water didn't cure uh, Naaman. It was God's mercy and God's grace because he was obedient to the word of the Lord. Obedience gets results. And when, uh, when he did obey and came up cleansed, he was a different Naaman. Now we don't have, pardon me, we don't have a Naaman now full of pride. We don't have a pompous, self-righteous, arrogant person anymore, as we'll see here in the next couple of verses. Verse 15. Naaman and all the attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now listen. Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. 
so please accept a gift from your servant. Note he said, please. He was no longer demanding. He said, please accept this gift from your servant. He recognizes there's only one true real God. He has been converted. Now he's a believer in the true God of Israel. And he knows that those pagan gods, which were many, are not true. And he wants, he goes right back to Naaman, or to uh, Elisha. Humbly he goes to him. And he's, and now here's Elisha. Now Elisha's not interested in Armani suits, or Calvin Klein, or Gucci shoes. His answer tells us this. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept the thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Alicia wasn't concerned about worldly wealth or material things. Now, there's nothing wrong with worldly wealth, riches. It's the attitude of your heart. You can be rich and be poor in spirit. You can be poor in spirit and you can be godly. Or you can be poor in worldly uh, goods and materials. And yet you could be poor towards God. So it's not the material things that makes it. It's the attitude of the heart. Carrying on here. Now this shows that there's something happened to Naaman. Now Naaman is a humble person. And he's talking on the same level or a little lower than Elisha. No longer talking down to him and demanding. Verse 17. If you will not say, Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings to the sacrifices of the other gods. Back then, deities in the lands, and there was many of them, they were territorial. If you went to a, another land, you would recognize their god. And they had this feeling that when... Uh, Naaman went back, if he took some of that soil of the God of Israel, then the God of Israel would recognize that territory in Iran. So it was just a culture thing back then, and Naaman wanted to make sure he covered all the bases. So that's, that explains why he was doing that. But there was another point here. Naaman recognized that this was a big change for him to go back to his king and show that he's cured. And he recognized that there was radical changes, but he was quite uh, concerned that he wouldn't be so radical that he would turn his king away from him. So in verse 18, verse, 19, or yeah, verse 18, he said, May the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. Now he's pleading with Elisha. He said, when my master enters the temple of Reman to, to bow down and he is leaning on my arm and I have to bow there also, when I bow down, may your servant forgive. May your servant forgive me for what I am, uh, for what I am doing. And Elisha said to him, go in peace. So not only had Naaman been uh, converted not only had he recognized the true God in Israel, but he was being transparent and he was letting Elisha know that he would have to still recognize uh, his king's wishes and he would take his time and he would probably relate to him slowly. But he knew a radical change wouldn't do it for him and he could get himself into hot water and the blessing would be spoiled. So there you have it with uh, Naaman. Uh, the king, and if you have also looked at, the Lord does not look at riches, he does not look at, worth, at worldly goods, the Lord looks at the heart. And so with Naaman, this is where this took place, he went back to uh, his country, and he went back and he was cleansed. Let's just look at a few things here that we want to reflect on. Three things I want you to, uh, to, uh, to go back a time to reflect. Are we proud and demanding? Does our pride hinder us? 
Do we have a humble heart? Does our pride hinder us from God's blessings? Do we display gratitude? Are we thankful? Are we thankful for salvation? Are we thankful for God's mercy? Are we obedient to God's word? Are we obedient to his word? Do we study it? That's why I asked for the Bibles if you wanted a Bible. It's a good thing to come to church and bring your Bible with you. Number one, because you'll have your Bible ready there. And also you can follow what I'm saying if I'm saying anything wrong. But the Lord wants us to be obedient to him. He wants us to recognize that he is the Lord and it's through him that things happen. Not through any uh, works that we do or anything like that. So that's what we need to look, that's what we need to be sure of, that the Lord is working in our lives. Three things that we need to do, just in closing. Count your blessings. If you look at Psalm 136, whenever you get a chance, you don't have to turn there right now. The Lord is good and his love endures forever. Express your thanks to God. 17, I will give thanks to you because of your righteousness. I will sing praises to the name of the Lord Most High. And if you think you're getting a raw deal like Naaman thought, he thought that this prophet should treat him with respect, even though he had this leprosy, and at that time he had forgotten about it. He was more interested in his pride. Just step back. Just step back and take a look, and you will see what the Lord is telling you, Psalm 86. If you step back there and see what the Lord told Samuel, that he looks at the heart as he was looking for another king to replace Saul. So there you have it. Count your blessings and remember Laman, because of his pride, he could have forfeited the blessings, but someone spoke to him and told him, just do as the Lord asked you to do and you will be cleansed. Let's pray. Show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths, guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. And I thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace that you have given to us, and I just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
remain standing for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his, his face towards you and give you peace. For we thank you, Lord, for this morning and for your word. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget uh, the celebration party in the fellowship hall. So if you'd like to go there, that would be great. Thank you for coming. Thank you.